Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see everybody here today. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome our alumnus, Martin and Michaels, back to the College of Law and to Deneen Hall for the first time. Uh, Mr. Michaels graduated from the College of Law in 1996, earning both a JD and a master's degree in international relations from the Maxwell School. The following year, he earned an LLM in tax from the University of Miami School of Law. Um, he has been practicing for um, almost 20 years. He is now a partner in the um, Baker McKenzie Law Firm, one of the largest international law firms in the world. He has been working in the Zurich office for the last 16 years, and his expertise and his client representation revolve around um, tax area, wealth management, and international private banking, among other areas. In addition to being an accomplished lawyer, Mr. Michaels is also an accomplished teacher and author. He teaches in a number of LLM and MBA programs um, in various parts of the world. And he has published numerous articles and two treatises in the areas of international tax and estate planning. planning. I would like to welcome him for traveling from Zurich to Syracuse this weekend so that he could be here today to talk with you and deliver the first lecture in the 2016 Convocation Lecture Series. This series was developed to give our first year students an opportunity to hear from accomplished individuals with a variety of compelling and thought-provoking perspectives on current legal issues. And Mr. Michaels is a wonderful choice to start our series this year. He will share with you today his perspectives on how law is responding to the changes um, and challenges of our global economy. Um, listen carefully today, um, and you will learn what you can do in your time here at the College of Law to prepare yourself to meet the challenges in the practice areas that you are interested in pursuing and in making yourself a valuable asset to your clients as they navigate and compete in our global economy. So please welcome me, wel uh, join me in, wel in welcoming um, Mr. Michaels back to the College of Law. Before we get started, can you hear me okay? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Guys, that's pathetic. Let's try again. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Listen, for me, it's 6 o'clock in the evening. And as uh, I can attest, uh, I've been up since 1. So one more time. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Great, great. Um, I'd like to thank you, Margaret, for the lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Marnin Michaels. I am based in the Zurich office of Baker McKenzie. And uh, this year is coming up on year 18, living outside the United States on, uh, at Baker McKenzie. Uh, it is a pleasure to be home, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to be home. Uh, I haven't been back to the law school in a decade. Uh, in fact, the last time I was back, this building did not exist. Um, I will say this. I owe a very special debt of gratitude uh, to this law school. I was very young when I went to school, and very few law schools wanted a 20-year-old. Uh, and Syracuse was willing to take a 20-year-old. And uh, I have a very, uh, I'm sure there's a 20-year-old in the classroom saying, yes, that's me. OK. Um, and I have oh, the school a very large debt of gratitude for taking me in and mentoring me. And uh, there is a lot of my career that is a result of the law degree and the master's degree that I got at Syracuse. That doesn't mean it stops at Syracuse. It just means it's the first step. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to go through some ground rules, chat a little bit about the purpose of the discussion. I am definitely going to do one case study. I have a second case study just in case we ran out of time, or we, we had more time. I'm not sure I'll get into the second case study in a significant amount of detail. Uh, but I'll just mention it because I think for many of you in the room, the second one will be the single hottest issue in family law, inheritance law, and marital law in the next 50 years. So I think this is a, on the cusp of that, and I think you should at least think about this issue from that perspective. So let's talk about ground rules. I want everyone to take out your phones. Put them on mute or vibrate. Okay. I would rather you all do this now than be embarrassed in the middle of the class in a session 
all of a sudden, when you find out, oops, it goes off. And then you got the dean over here giving you a nasty look. And you're like, oh, no, that goes to the end of my career. And you know, there goes career services. So take it out now, OK? The next thing, which is always a ground rule that I have, is if you have a question, raise your hand and ask the question. I ask you to make it a good one. But really, you're taking time from your day. This is part of school. I would really ask you to make the point to take the time and ask the questions. Because if you have the question, I guarantee that someone else, at least half the people in the room, have the question. And you are the only one with the courage to raise your hand and ask the question. Now, I recognize that many of you may not speak English as your first language. Some of you. I understand the LLM students are in here. If you are an LLM student and English is not your first language, raise your hand. I would ask you, if I speak too fast, or I use an expression that's not clear, you tell them, say, hey, I didn't understand. Okay. If I say something that doesn't make sense to you, it is important that you say, I don't understand. There is no point for you to be here if you're not understanding what I'm saying. I also have a couple of favors here. I need three volunteers. The first volunteer is I want someone from the back row to make sure if you can't hear me, I need a volunteer. Come on, guys, raise your hand. OK. The, the lady uh, in the blue, with the blue, if I cannot be heard, can we agree you raise your hand? OK. I need another volunteer from somewhere over here. Come on, guys. It's not a test, OK? The gentleman in the pink shirt. Is it a white shirt? White shirt. OK. <laughs> your job is, if I'm speaking too fast, you have to raise your hand and say, it's not clear. I need someone from this side of the room. Come on, I need a volunteer. The gentleman with the Nike cap on. Your job is, at 1230 and 1240, to raise your hand. And so I know the time. Fair? OK. Now, for all of you who didn't raise your hand, you lost your opportunity for some delicious Swiss chocolate. <laughs> that, my friend, is probably the single most important lesson you learned in law school today. OK, OK. So what's the purpose of the discussion? The purpose of the discussion is to talk a little bit about how science and technology are making law evolve at a pace unknown in the history of the world. We are dealing with issues at a pace that the law was never designed to deal with. And how we deal with that, I find very interesting. Um, my guess is at this point, what are you about, at six weeks into school, something like that? Some of these cases you may have studied already. Johnson v. McIntosh, Pearson v. Post. Gen v. Rich, Keeble v. Heckering, and Armory v. Dilamari. My guess is everyone in this room, whether you're out of school 30 years, 50 years, like my uncle uh, up there, I'd like to note that he's up there, and I thank him for coming, probably studied every one of these cases. Okay? They ain't nothing that's changed. But let's look at some of these cases. Did all, they all have something in common. They're all older cases. And they're all relatively simple fact patterns, like, my cousin next door owns a fox. The fox jumps into my field, and when it's in my field, dies. Who owns the right to the carcass? I guarantee you it took about 400 years to come up with that law. OK, that gets decided in that case. So you have to start, as a law student, learning the basics. But this is a relatively simple fact pattern compared to the way the world has become. Today, we have the following points. Money moves fast. We're not talking a check that takes three days to clear. We're talking billions of dollars transfer in tenths of a second. And they go anywhere in the world at any time. We are no longer in a manufacturing economy. We are in the fourth industrial re revolution. We are in an idea economy. The wealth that is created today is because someone, up here, someone thinks of something up here that has never been thought of and takes it to fruition. There are industries today that did not exist when I went to law school. 
Facebook, Uber, to name a few, Airbnb. It's changing the way the world works. The idea that the largest renter of hotel rooms in the world does not own a single hotel is something that would have never been thought of 20 years ago. The basic principles of finance and financial accounting are changing fast. Supply chain management means that even the simplest flow of goods to manufacture the simplest product is going through multiple countries all the time. There are national security interests that give multiple use property very complicated issues. And let's not forget about the definition of the word espionage and whether or not you are violating an espionage rule by doing a very simple thing. And the science is changing so fast that the core conceptions of life are changing as to what is life, how conception occurs, how a human being is born, and how you make a baby. This is changing so fast that there are things being thought of today that even 10 years ago were not even thought of as being realistically possible. So what I'm going to try to do in the time I have is I want to try to do two examples. I want to talk about the example of life in an idea economy by looking at a case study of a company called Wonderland International, a company that I guarantee you none of you have ever heard of, but if I told you has greater than 50% of the market share with regard to child and baby safety equipment in the world, you wouldn't believe it, but it actually does. It has 52% of market share globally on any form of strollers, baby car, baby car seats, anything to do with, the, with, with anything with child safety. And then I'd like to talk about the evolving biology of the science of having a baby. The birds and the bees, they don't apply anymore. And what does that mean here? I'm going to try to at least touch on the second example. So let's talk a little bit about Wonderland International. What do they make? They make baby strollers. They make car seats. They make pretty much all forms of baby safety gear, including swings, high chairs, and cribs. You've never heard of them. What if I told you these are some of the brands they get known as? Do these mean anything to you? There's a reason why some of these brands operate, on, they operate under different brands in different countries because of A, marketing, B, the relationship in which they work with is how they distribute their product. These mean something to you. Wonderland International, um, a company where its executive headquarters it's a Swiss company. Um, it's a company where its executive headquarters are based in Taiwan um, and has manufacturing plants primarily in the People's Republic of China, but not limited to that. So tell me, how much, how much old economy can you get than a simple baby stroller? I mean, look at this. This is about as old economy as you get. Okay? People have been using these for a long time. Let's, let's talk about this. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes going through with you some of the basic issues associated with how you make a simple stroller like this goes in tight. Now, let's talk about this. How do you design a stroller? Where do you design a stroller? The one thing I will tell you in the world that is, diff that is consistently different around the world is people's tastes are the only thing that changes from location to location. In America, America interprets big as good. So a big stroller is viewed as a good stroller, even if the quality of the manufacturing is not as good. In Japan, the thinner, the lighter the stroller, the better the quality is, is valued more. So where one chooses to design a stroller, is a huge issue because tastes change and tastes are different. Which makes for an interesting question. Obviously, when you are designing a stroller, in fact, uh, last week I was meeting with the CEO, he said their biggest issue now is how do you make strollers more beautiful? And how do you make, you know, art and manufacturing are now confluencing because people believe people, it's a bit of feng shui. 
which is the more beautiful something is, the more aesthetic something is, the more enjoyable it is, and the more usable it is. So you might manufacture, or sorry, let me say, you might design a US stroller for the US market in Pennsylvania. You might design a stroller for the Japanese market in Japan. You might design a stroller for the European market somewhere in the European Union. But the question is, it may be, the concepts may be designed there, but who owns the rights to the patents and the trademarks? And this is a very complicated issue these days because who owns patents? The only value is the patents and the trademarks, the ideas. And where you put that is very important. That's an issue that comes up. Safety, okay? You have US standards for safety. You have European standards for safety. You have Japanese standards for safety. You have, the PRC has its own standards for safety. When you are designing a stroller, do you design that stroller to be used in all the markets at the same time? Do you design that, market to be, that stroller to be in different markets? How do you do the safety tests? Where do you do the safety tests? And the like. Well, I will tell you from a production perspective, this stroller right here, while it's sold in the US, is also sold in Europe, it's sold in the People's Republic of China, and it's also sold in Japan. This stroller is compliant with at least six countries' design standards. Many of them are inconsistent with each other. And when this stroller is tested, it goes through safe in the People's Republic of China, it goes through six different safety standards at the same time. Now, you see I have on the here, how does espionage come into this? And you're saying to myself, espionage. Well, you probably haven't covered this yet, and probably won't cover this for a while, if at all, which is espionage is complying with the rules of a foreign government on local soil, right? That's the quintessential def definition of espionage. So, when this is being manufactured in China, in the PRC, and they're testing it for European Union standards, in compliance with European Union standards, and the reports will be provided to Brussels, are you committing espionage? And before you say, oh, this is not so simple, the permits that are needed to comply with those rules in the PRC are huge, are significant and it makes life more difficult. Next issue, supply chain. How many of you, ever, you have even heard the term supply chain before today? I'm impressed, okay. Supply chain, that actually, that was about two thirds of the classroom. I was very impressed with that, that's, that's very impressive. Supply chain is the concept of how and where you manufacture to get all the pieces that you source from all over the world to the right place at the right time to build the product. You may have heard the concept of just in time. Okay, just in time. You don't want a factory of yarn or a factory of rubber tires sitting around. You want the tire showing up on the day you need it because that's how you control costs. That's how you avoid damage. Where do you source the materials for the supply chain? Well, Oftentimes, these days, the person who's manufacturing this, well, in this case, the factory makes also this, but they don't make the fabric. Where do you get the fabric from? Not only where do you get the fabric from, but who is making the yarn? If one person, if one company in this chain happens to do business with Iran or Cuba or North Korea, you have totally destroyed the ability to sell this product in North America because that would be a violation of the sanction rules in the United States, and no one's gonna take that risk. So the issue of supply chain and these types of issues come up all the time. By the way, I missed something when I talked here about the issue of safety. I haven't even gotten to the whole issue of torts and the foreseeable misuse standard. Um, you'll learn that in torts at some point. Lucky you, okay. Let's talk about manufacturing. The question is, where do you manufacture? How do you manufacture? How do you distribute? How many of you have heard of the, contract, uh, the concept called contract manufacturing? Con yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed. Contract manufacturing is the idea that the person manufacturing this 
is not the person distributing this. It's not the brand under which it goes under. So for example, Graco is owned by Rubbermaid. So I'm sure some of you have Googled already and say, Wonderland International, Graco, what's the connection? Graco is a marketing company owned by Rubbermaid. However, the patents that make the baby carriages, that make the car seats, are owned by Wonderland International. And the product manufacturing is done by, owned by, uh, great, by Wonderland International. It's a historical issue. Don't ask me how it started. It's historical how those companies bifurcated. From a liability perspective, it's quite smart, because behind, uh, behind Graco, there's nothing. There's no, there's no there there. It's just a marketing company. Um, the question is, where does one manufacture? What are the labor issues associated with, with manufacturing? Are there national security issues associated with manufacturing? And before you say, that, say it's not possible, I'll make the following observation to you. There, most forms of high-level technology today are what is called multiple-use technology. Multiple-use technology means the, the, the same item that makes this thing can also be using to make an M16 or an IPG or some form of bomb, or even something more significant than that. How do you balance the, the same equipment that makes this and make sure it doesn't get used by the wrong person to make a nuclear bomb? And before you say that, I'll come to some slides in a bit that shows how significant this is. Shipping. How does one ship? Do you put it in the mail? You don't. Um, do you put it by air, by air cargo? Do you put it by shipping cargo? Do you say, I leave it at the factory, and then it's someone else's responsibility to figure out how you get the material to wherever you need to do it? These questions come up all the time. And how does one set a price? Before you say, hey, this is the place of how one sets a price, I want to point out, this company has greater than 50% of global market share. When it sets a price, there's a risk that that is a cartel action. Cartel, um, antitrust in the US, it's called antitrust. Cartel, are you somehow violating antitrust laws? And before you go a step further, in many countries, you have requirements that when you import something, you have to go through a single distributor. And the single distributor agrees to sell the price at a certain price. So you do that, you say, how can you have two countries standing right next to each other selling at different prices? You can't, you have to have the same price. You have to balance that with, are you somehow getting into a monopolistic antitrust provision? Happens, this is, we were dealing with this just last week. Distribution, do you use direct in distribution or indirect distribution? In the context of Wonderland, Graco is indirect distribution. They sell the products. Wonderland sells the products to Graco. Graco's in charge of distributing. In the contrast, this brand, Nuna, the company owns and then distributes it under its own brand, Nuna. Um, and the difference is here, it goes through, it's a very high-end stroller, going through very high-level high brands, and going through a very um, boutique. So it's sold um, through Nordstrom's in the US. I believe it's also sold through, is Nordstrom's a company in the US? Yes, sorry. And is Dillard's, is it? So it's Nordstrom and Dillard's. But this is not competing at Babies R Us. Why is that? Because that's Graco's primary distribution chain. And all those issues that come up to those issues, direct or indirect, and then we got the tax issues, something near and dear to my heart, OK? How many of you had heard of transfer pricing? I'm impressed. Transfer pricing is the concept where someone says, let me give you the example of what used to be done. You had a company in the People's Republic of China or in Taiwan where the manufacturing would take place. You'd have a company in Switzerland, typically in a place called Zug, where a bill would be sent to the company in Zug, which would buy the product low and sell the product, and then immediately sell the product to another place at a high price. So you'd sell it to the US or the UK at a high price. And the profit would be made in a place in Zug where the tax rate was 8%. And so people, and by the way, the goods would never actually go through Switzerland. And people would say, ah, I made all my profit in Switzerland, no tax. Countries about 20, 25 years ago got smart about this, and they said, Ah, 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 we don't care how you say 
the profit is, we look at the economic allocation of the economic activity, and we allocate the tax accordingly. So now, when you do these things, you have to think about where is a country going to say the profit is properly earned, irrespective of how you deem the profit to be earned? VAT, value-added tax. In the U.S., it's called sales tax. How you price that, how you manufacture it. VAT is the single most difficult tax to address, the single most regressive tax to deal with in the world, but it's also the single biggest revenue generator in the world. How do you deal with that? Income taxation. How do you pay people? Where do you realize your income? How do you negotiate an effective global tax rate of about 10%, which is what you really need to be competitive in the global market industry today? Because that's the universal standard. It's between 8 and 10% for global taxation of a corporate multinational. And then patent box income. How is the income from the patents taxed? Where do you have it taxed? Who owns the patents? Where are the royalties? All these issues come up all the time. Why did I pick Wonderland? Okay. Well, I happen to be on the board of the company. Um, okay. This is actually, this picture is taken in the showroom in the People's Republic of China. Are anyone here from the PRC? No one from the PRC. This, oh, I'm sorry, yes. This is taken about five, I had to drive about five hours from Shenzhen. Yeah, five, this is five hours from Shenzhen in the car. No, it's two provinces over. But we have 28,000 people employed in this plant. Okay. Now, let me explain something to you about the way manufacturing is done in the PRC. It is like a college campus. You have dormitories, depending on your level of seniority. You have dormitories that are like college dorms, and you have dorms that are like apartments, really nice apartments. I have my own apartment, actually, on the dorm. In, 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 it's, yes, because I really need an apartment in the PRC on a permanent basis. But I actually, they call it the director's apartment. Um, so the meals, there are five meals produced a day, given complimentary to the workers. They live oftentimes 1,000 you know, or so miles away from where the families come. Oftentimes, the workers come completely uneducated, and they're trained on the job. And many of these people spend their entire lives. There are outstanding schools. There are real challenges to be actually people want to send their kids to these schools. And some of the factories that want the best people provide exceptional education. You have people who spend their entire lives on these campuses being trained. And before you say, why is US manufacturing dying? Look at the competition. It's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of living. So this is a little bit about me on the factory. This is actually a, fact this is actually a factory uh, and a factory. This is me walking around. This is a showroom. This is my partner, Michael Wong, and the, and the CEO, Kenny Chang, primary owner. Um, and this is in front of the new dorm. We'll talk about this in a second. Now, I want to talk about this in the evolving world. Going green is good business. Throughout the factories, they have ivy growing throughout the factories. And why is that? It has been found in every study that when you have green in a factory, it pumps oxygen in, takes the carbon dioxide out, and workers enjoy having green, particularly if they're in an environment where they may not see natural light all day. It actually makes the workers more efficient. Now, this is the new dorm. This dorm will suit 2,000 people. There are apartments in this dorm. 2,000 people will live in this dorm, ranging from three people in a room for, for young people to apartments that are two, three-bedroom apartments for senior managers who've been at the factories longer time. And this is my partner, uh, Michael Wong. Uh, from the Taipei office. This is the CEO, Kenny, plant managers, director, and Michael. We can go into it. You know, Michael's on the board of the charity that owns 40% of the business because our goal is to give 40% of the, of the wealth to charity, in many ways, like the Gates Foundation does. Um, in fact, I would tell you, you don't want to know the size. It's, it's a nine figure uh, charity. Now, I joke about this national security issues at play, but I want to show you something here. You see this machine? This machine 
is a dual time, is a tool die machine. It's used to make everything here. It's also capable of making a bomb. It's also capable of making an RPG. This thing has no less than 15 chips in it that sense what it's making, how it's making it, the speed at which whatever is being made is made. If the machine moves less, more than a centimeter, it sells. And countries around the world have satellites overhead sensing these chips to ensure that this vehicle is not being used for an inappropriate use. And this is happening throughout the PRC at the moment. And by the way, that is espionage. And you have to get permission from the PRC government to allow yourself to do this, because otherwise, it really is espionage. Um, national security issues in play. Any questions about my Wonderland example? Who's nauseous? Okay. You didn't study any of this in law school yet. OK, but let me point out to you, my friends, in any type of business today, doing any type of law today, on any type of corporate level, these are the issues that come up. These are really the issues. Now, the stuff you're learning about in law school in your first year is the base by which these things come up. So it's very important that you learn these things first. It's also very important that the first year is about critical thinking and analyzing cases and speaking well and writing well. And that is those are the skills that are taught this year, which is the baseline for what we're talking about here. Questions, comments? All righty. Am I going too fast? All right. I'd like to talk about the next case study, which is the bi biology of making a baby. Now, over 5,000 years, maybe 15,000 years, the law has envisioned progeny in one of two ways. The first typically involves some Barry White and some Merlot. Okay. <laughs> By the way, my best friend, who is also a partner at Baker McKenzie, dared me to put the first thing on the slide. Okay. <laughs> so you could all say that was there. I am telling you, when this recording goes out, and I'm going to get a call from the Office of General Counsel saying, you put this on a Baker McKenzie letterhead, we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> okay. Okay. And adoption. Okay. That is historically. I don't care whether we're talking about Sharia law, Chinese inheritance rules, Indian inheritance rules, the Hindu succession rules, Jewish succession rules, the continental succession rules. It's all based on two premises of how people could make babies the entire time the world existed. That's the whole premise so far. What has changed? We have the old ways, plus we now have what's called assisted reproductive technology. Now, it used to be that art, is what it's called in the industry, was typically involving you know, maybe IVF, maybe a donor sperm, and that was it. We now have the ability to freeze an embryo. And 10 years after someone is born, someone, someone has died, create a new baby. Think about that. There, you know, when I was in law school, we talked about the, the period of time in which issue could be created was like nine months after the, de nine months after the death of the woman. There was a whole, lots of case law about that. That's off the table anymore. That's gone. Now, 10 years later, a baby can be born. You could have someone who made a sperm donation at 22 have a baby born 30 years later. And what rights are there? Couples can give birth after menopause. It raises questions about what the word issue means. You know, when is someone an issue? Who is issue? Well, you probably haven't learned that word yet. That's second year course. That's family, that's family law. You'll learn about that next year. Um, and by the way, we haven't even talked about what are the consequences of same-sex marriage on inheritance rules. For example, let's talk about a trust that says it's lost, established under the laws of the Cayman Islands. I'm picking that for a reason. And it says it may go to Ms. X and her spouse. 
And the person lives in New York, which recognizes same-sex marriage, so they're a spouse. But under Cayman law, same-sex marriage is not recognized. Is that person a spouse? Let's go a step further. Let's assume you have a same-sex couple, both women, and the woman who is the spouse for this definition is the one whose genetic material is used and carries the baby to fruition. Is that child a baby, a child of the, dece- of the testator as relevant here, or the creator of the trust, for the purposes of Cayman law? This has yet to be tested. This is the future. These are the questions that are going to come up. This is because the science is changing so fast that who knows what's coming up. Now, you think that's incredible. Within 10 years, we will see the science allow for a same-sex couple to use both of their genetic material, not involving any form of donor, to create a baby from the genetic material of those donors. And the issues with that, I think, are going to take 20 to 100 years to start to solve out. But this is going to start to be an issue. Is that person even a child under current law, from an inheritance law perspective, from, a, from other types of you know, there are ways to solve it with, with things like uh, adoption? But what if the country doesn't recognize the same-sex marriage or this type of child? This borderlines on cloning, and cloning will be a science which will have a huge controversy for the next 50 years. This is your generation's problem to deal with. I'll be retired. It's not my problem. Okay. Okay. And if you don't believe me, this article appeared in Time Magazine last year. So if it's already appearing in Time Magazine, this is no longer something that's going to happen in the future. This is really not far away from happening. Any questions so far? We've talked about this. It's not so far away. And the question is, how does this fit into inheritance rules, domestic relations rules? This is the question of the next decade. It's 1235. I have about five minutes for a case study. Now, the case study did not happen in the US, and I don't have a slide on this on purpose. The fact pattern goes as follows. You're all adults, right? I can, okay. Okay. There is no question that consensual sex happened. There's no question about that. There's no question that a condom was used. No one argues that. However, the person in question, the female in question, took the condom and used it to inseminate herself. And the question became, because the gentleman who was my client was a very wealthy guy, you know, what are his support obligations in that context? Okay? Because no one argues consent, no one argues it occurred, no one argues the condom wasn't used. The question was, was the taking of the condom and using it without the person's permission to create a baby, create parental rights? And the short answer is the answer was yes. The, the, the court in Germany held that yes, that that was the case. Now, OK, that's an extreme case. But I'm just showing that example. Listen, there's a moral of the story, which I'm not going to tell in this room. OK, 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 OK. Yes, you guys, think what you're thinking. Good. OK, OK, OK. There's a reason why I no longer practice in the US. I would get sued. OK, OK, OK. Um, I use that as an example, because if you think that's bad, um, imagine what's going to happen when you can take a hair follicle from two people and make a baby. And that's what's going to happen in the next 10 years. And the issues that come with this, this is, this is, this is your, the cases when you guys start to become partners in law firms or 
you know, work in other, other areas. These are the cases that you're going to have to deal with in 20 years. So what are my conclusions? My conclusions are the history of the world has always been law plays catch up. The science evolves, the fact pattern evolves, and the law catches up. However, what's also crystal clear is the pace in which science and technology are changing means that you don't have 10 years to come up with a conclusion anymore. It's the lawyer who's analyzing the situation has to make that decision based on the information they have, and they got to make a judgment call because there's no law. More and more, there's no guidance. The courts have to make judgments when there's no guidance out there. And we are playing catch up now faster and faster, and the systems are not there. And if I were to say science, technology, and medicine are changing so fast that the law is always in a constant state of catch up, what does that mean for you guys? It means for you guys, a law degree by itself is not enough in the new economy. You have to be financially literate. You have to be scientifically literate. You have to be culturally literate. Now, you have an opportunity here. I mean, you don't necessarily have to get a full second degree, but my advice to you is you have an opportunity to take a course in finance over at the business school, take the course. You have an opportunity to take a science course, take it. Take an economics course because everything today is either about finance or science, or both. You have to make an effort to be more literate. I'll also go a step further. You need to be culturally literate. Culturally literate, culturally literate means you have to be, un understand that your clients will not necessarily be from where you're from. May work under different values, different systems. And I will tell you, all over the world, people come to the United States to study. If it's the United States or England for a year. They understand your culture. My question is, do you understand the culture and have the experience of the, the other way around? This becomes much more important. Understanding how other people think makes a difference. And that's the competition that the world you're dealing with. Any questions so far? OK. So we have about 10 minutes for questions, or I promise 10 minutes. Uh, I could spend a few minutes about how I got to where I am, but I think that's probably pretty boring for you. I mean, I can spend a few minutes on that, but I'd like to ask you, do you have any questions about what we talked about today? No questions? How many of you are nauseous? Is that a question? Oh, okay. okay, you're at 10 minutes. Thank you. OK. Was there another question? Okay. Then I misspoke. Let me, then I misspoke. My point is you either have to be scientifically literate, and scientifically can be biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, or any version of that. Or you have to be financially literate, which means you have to understand the principles of economics, finance, and, the, and those issues, or both. both. But it doesn't matter what it is, but you have to at least have some understanding of something in, this, in, in the science area for many of the types of law that exist today. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask you to take the microphone because I'm not sure. So for when you were talking about the cloning and talking about um, what kind of questions we would have to pose to see what would constitute it as a human, couldn't you just apply the same concept from the Turing test over? That was the question. I think it's a good question. The question is, do you apply the standard? 
Unfortunately, it's not my judgment call to make that standard. I will tell you there are people in this country and other people that do not believe cloning will be a form of, is a viable form of, is a acceptable legal form of life. I'm not saying I disagree with you, but that's going to be the question that comes up in the next, next decade and 20 years from now. It's not my call to make that. I can make my, listen, I can make all sorts of arguments, but it's just an argument. And further, different countries will have different standards there. Yes, ma'am. Um, it seems from your presentation that there are so many aspects of law that kind of blur the lines between the traditional distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, so in moving forward as we're all law students, do you think it's, in your opinion, beneficial to have a greater knowledge of different fields, uh, like national security issues and the commerce side of it? Or do you think it's better to be highly, um, to have your skills to be highly specific? It's an excellent question. It's an excellent question about do you want to be a generalist or do you a specialist? Well, I will posit to you the following. In your law school education, you should learn as much as you can on as many different areas of the law as possible. Okay. You are too young in your career to specialize. And further, you know, one of my weaknesses, I never took a corporations course in, in law school. Sorry, Chris. Um, uh, but you know, there are areas where I never took, a, took courses. And even today, I must say, I've learned it, but there's still gaps. On the other hand, I must tell you, I took a commercial transactions course with Professor Malloy. And even now, there are things from that class that come up that, you know, that spot me out, that spot. So my view is take as many hard classes as you can and learn as much as you can and don't worry about the grade. And then, then what will happen to you is when you start practicing, you'll end up in a department. And then when you end up in a department, you will start to specialize. And you specialize because that's how you get good. But somewhere about 10 years out of school, you'll start to broaden again. Because as you become less the person in the back room and more the person in the front room, clients don't come with you and say, I have, excuse my expression, I have a 1031 exchange problem. Clients don't come to that. They may think they have a 1031 exchange problem and find out they have a completely other problem. So the only way you're able to handle that is you have to get special, you have to get, get a broad education. Then for the first ten, five to 10 years of your career, you'll spend specialized and then you'll broaden out again naturally. My day, without exaggeration, um, I will do insurance regulatory issues, securities regulatory issues, the criminal defense case, a tax thing occasionally because I still am a tax lawyer, a private client issue, advising the CEO about the question of how you, uh, you grow a business, what are the risk issues with that. Those things happen over time. You naturally, that naturally evolves with your practice. It usually involves between someone somewhere in the office yelling at me a couple of times. But um, me being an idiot is typically said by more people every day than typically by my, by, by, by my partners, um, typically when I piss them off. Um, okay. Next question. OK, so uh, we have a few minutes left. Are there any, anything else that would like to be discussed? If not, any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. I was kind of curious to know how you went from the United States to Switzerland to apply just a little bit Okay, that's okay. Well, thank you for asking the question. Um, I wish I had a great story. Like, I had a love of the Swiss Alps from the time I was five years old. Or I met this very cute Swiss miss that brought me over there. Okay. Okay. I wish I had some story like that. Um, in the end of the day, it came down to the fact that I was very young when I went through school. I worked at a firm in Buffalo, New York, uh, doing uh, around the time NAFTA came out. I already had a master's in international relations. And uh, Baker McKenzie in their Zurich office was looking for someone who was young. So all the things that had always been a negative for me, my age, 
my background, my experience. They wanted that. Um, and the opportunity came, and I said, why not? And I remember my uncle's up in the room. I think he thought I was crazy when I took the job. Um, you know, uh, um, by the way, my uncle also teaches in the law school in the, uh, he teaches a trial practice course, and I would urge you to take the course if you have an opportunity. Uh, if you want to be, if advocacy, what? Yeah, but he teaches twice. In your career, he'll teach twice the course. It, but um, I will say the following. It wasn't planned. It wasn't a dream. I must say um, it was pretty scary. And I'll tell you, the first five years were really hard. Because I was two years out of school. Not only was I learning to be a good lawyer, I was learning it in an environment where I wasn't in an American law firm in Switzerland. I was in the Swiss office of an international law firm. I didn't know how to pay a bill. I didn't know how to make a phone call. Okay, by the way, 001 is how you call the states. I, you don't teach you that anywhere else. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't figure out how to do the basic things, and it was really hard. And the Swiss, um, I love them now, but they are very special people. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I hope there are no Swiss in the room, right? Okay. <laughs> I actually have a Swiss passport now, so I can get away with saying that. But you're doing, it was very, very hard. And it was very challenging. And I must say, I was very unhappy for the first five years. Um, but I think I partially also stick with it because I wasn't going to let myself fail. Um, and I don't regret it. I think it was a, a very good experience. But it, it was not planned. And my advice to anyone in the classroom who's actually thinking about wanting to do a career that is more cross-border, the solution is not to say, I want to live outside the United States. The solution is to say, you get good at a substantive area first. Then on that, you add on a cross-border element. Despite what all the professors here will say, there's no such thing as international law. Okay? There's no such, there may be public international law, but I don't know anyone who earns a living doing it. Um, okay. Commercial. What the commercial, what is called international law, is actually just a cross-border transaction, which involves two jurisdictions, a, tr a transaction crossing at least two jurisdictions and making the rules mirror. You have to get good first laws in your jurisdiction and understanding that, and then you add on the other side. And remember something. You probably haven't studied this yet. What's the standard for malpractice if you're a lawyer in a jurisdiction where you're admitted? Departure from good and acceptable standards in the jurisdiction which you practice. What is the standard of malpractice when you advise in a jurisdiction where you don't have a license? Besides the US issues about uh, unauthorized practice of law, which is a unique US specific issue. Strict liability. Did you study strict liability yet? Which means if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter why, you're, you're liable. Um, you always have to work with someone who is knowledgeable who puts it together. And um, that's how it works. But this is the future. The future is um, working on transactions across the border. That's just the way it works. 1251, you guys have to go to class. Thank you.